in chapter 38 of, uh, of Genesis. We uh, have uh, this chapter here, what seems to be uh, almost out of place and kind of an interlude as in chapter 37. We turn to corner in the life of Joseph and, and then of course chapter 39 and the rest of the book continue, continues on. But uh, Moses had something in mind here in placing this here and there's, um, there's some interesting things about um, the contrast between Joseph and, uh, and his uh, older brother Judah here. But uh, uh, the bottom line is this is another one of those chapters if you and I were writing the Bible, we just wouldn't put it in here. <laughs> because it's one of those where it goes from sin to worse sin to worse sin and then it really gets bad before it ever gets, uh, gets worse. But it's also another one of those tremendous testimonies because it's we get to see the turning point in Judah's life like in Abraham like in Isaac like in Jacob there's a lot writing on Judah uh, and his relationship with the Lord because it's through him of course we know that all of the kings of Israel would come including King David through whom the Messiah would uh, would come as well so he having a son that would have a son becomes very critical to the story of uh, uh, of redemption and certainly this is a story uh, about surprises and the fact that people can can radically change I remember uh, uh, very early on going to Calvary Honolulu when it was about this size and sitting uh, in McKinley High School one one morning and and uh, and bending down the row and happened to see another guy bend down the row that way and it was uh, uh, a guy that I used to uh, work with a little bit at Safeway and party with a lot and uh, I could see the expression on his face, probably mirrored the expression on my face. His thoughts were probably my thoughts. What's that guy doing here? I just We both had that same like, uh, I can't believe that guy is here uh, at the same time. Uh, and uh, it was fun to talk uh, afterwards and stuff and hear about how we both had come, come to know the Lord and how God can radically change lives. And, and Judah is, is one of those individuals that God gets a hold of his life but as I said things get get worse before they get better let's take a look at the first 11 uh, verses and uh, before I read it maybe just in case you don't know in in the culture at this time which we're at about 1400 BC we know from uh, archaeology that they did the same thing that eventually Moses wrote uh, you know 400 years later at about a thousand BC when he writes the law there on Mount Sinai and that is it was so important that you had to be completely committed to your family so that uh, if your older brother, who then the line passes through, who gets the inheritance, if your older brother was not able to produce a son and before he died, then that next son, if he's not married, would then marry his brother's wife so that he could produce a child for his brother through whom again the name and the line and so forth would pass so it's something we see in the law of Moses but it was also very uh, very common in the ancient world that Judah lives here and uh, and a little bit of the story kind of certainly frames around that idea verse 1 and uh, here we are in chapter uh, 38 it came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain uh, a Dulamite whose name was Hira it's not Hura it's Hira and Judah saw there was a uh, daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he married her and went into her, so she conceived and bore a son. And he called his name Er. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. She conceived again and bore a son and called his name Shelah. He was uh, at Hazib when she bore him. Then Judah took a wife for Er for his firstborn. And her name was Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. And Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and marry her, and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. Uh, and it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he emitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. For he said, Lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. 
probably not too many memory scriptures that you're going to put on your refrigerator from that passage. Uh, the duty here or the obligation, we would say, is the result of uh, Judah's growing family. A couple things about his family. And the first is to note that he married a Canaanite, of course, which was forbidden for Abraham, uh, for Isaac, for Jacob. Uh, back in chapter 24, we see Abraham say to his servant, Swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife or my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. And we've talked about the Canaanites before, uh, that they were probably uh, the most perverted people that ever has lived on the planet. That is borne out by uh, archaeological remains. Everything that we know about these people, and certainly by scripture uh, as well. And uh, the things that they were into, uh, you wouldn't want to discuss in, uh, in mixed company. Uh, a very, uh, again, cruel and very, uh, you know, burning their children in the fire to Molech and so forth, as well as the incredible sexual per perversion. There was good reason why Abraham was saying to his servant, whatever you do, don't let my son take a wife from among the Canaanites. And, uh, and of course, we have the same thing when uh, Isaac sent uh, Jacob off to Mesopotamia. Uh, he said the same thing in chapter 28. You must not take a wife from the Canaanites. So it's not like Judah doesn't know this. Judah knows this. <laughs> He's just, Judah's being Judah. He's just kind of uh, doing his own thing. But uh, there, there's a lot more writing on Judah, though he's the fourth born son because of the behavior of the other three. Reuben, the number one son, through whom the seed, the name, and the promises should pass, of course, has disqualified himself. Well, you remember he slept with his stepmother. Uh, so he's kind of out of it. And uh, we're going to see comments that uh, follow his life all the way to the end of Jacob's life. Then you've got the other two sons, Simeon and Levi. Uh, oh, yeah, they're mass murderers. So uh, they're kind of off the list as well uh, because of what they did in Shechem. So it all comes down to Judah. He's number, number four. So there's a lot riding on him and his wife and his potential, potential son. But notice it begins in this compromise with who he's hanging out with. Uh, verse 1, Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Dudalmite whose name was Hira. So this, you know, again, it's, it's often who you hang out with. Uh, I know that uh, as parents, when your kids are little and growing up, you're very concerned about their friends. You're very concerned about the uh, influences over their lives. Guess what? As adults, we should be very concerned about ourselves and uh, who's, who's influencing us, who we're hanging out with and so forth. So this is a huge thing when it says that uh, he was hanging out. And again, we'll see him later in the story. This is one of his buddies, this guy, Hira. And, uh, and then he's with him. Wrong guy, wrong crowd, wrong place. And he ends up seeing in verse 2, a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her. A couple things about this. One is the fact that Moses never records the woman's name. What was his wife's name? We don't know. It's not even recorded because uh, uh, I think there's a bit of disdain even in, uh, in that sense. Uh, also in the idea in verse 2, it's... Uh, uh, and again, it's this sense that it's uh, lust at first sight. You know, when he's a Caesar, they do it, they're married, that's it. Very, uh, very abrupt uh, in everything. And of course, all of this uh, goes against everything that Abraham tried to say, Isaac tried to say, Jacob tried to say and warn, uh, warn his sons. Paul has the same warning for us in the, in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians six fourteen. do not be unequally yoked. Together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness and lawlessness, and what common, uh, what communion has light and darkness together? So warned over and over again. So it's that uh, in his life, a compromise of who his close friends were that led him to go to places he shouldn't have been going, uh, and that leads to his uh, marriage to someone he should not have married, uh, and she kind of passes off the scene here. Uh, we'll see in a moment, but I think we're. Uh, we've just, I think Christians in America have kind of, uh, I don't know what it is, but we've just kind of are getting absorbed into the culture more and more instead of actually uh, being those that actually are light and salt and are changing the culture. Uh, Paul says this well, when he's giving his testimony before King Agrippa. And every time Paul had the opportunity 
uh, to stand before one of these kings or somebody in, uh, in power and so forth, even though he was arrested and accused him of a crime, he would always use it as an opportunity to preach the gospel and share his testimony. And he's doing that uh, before Agrippa. And he's talking about his own conversion on the Damascus Road where he's blinded, knocked on the ro- uh, down on the road. God appears before him. Paul, Paul, you know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me and so forth? And then eventually uh, Jesus commissions him And Paul uses these words. He's supposed to go to unbelievers to, verse 18, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified uh, by faith in me. So that's his commission. In a sense, that's uh, our commission as well in terms of the great commission to take the gospel to people that don't believe. I think sometimes we misunderstand. We don't see that their eyes are not open. Uh, We don't see that, in a sense, spiritually, they live in darkness. And we certainly don't see or understand sometimes they live under the power of Satan. Is that what it says? That unbelievers live under the power of Satan? That's what it says. I think if we understand that, then the idea of relationships and, and, uh, and so forth should take on a different light. Hey, who's your good friend there? Well, I don't know, but he's definitely under the power of Satan, but he's a really nice guy other than that. You know, we, we don't really think in those, in those terms, but we, but we should. Hey, she's a sweet-looking gal. Yeah, she's really nice. Under the power of Satan, other than that, she's just a great gal. You know, we, we don't think in those terms. But Paul says in 2 Corinthians that, that the, uh, the unbelievers... Eyes are blinded to the, to the truth of the gospel. And he says, and they can't understand it. It's, uh, it's impossible for them. It's foolishness to them. And of course, our worldview of who we are, what our life is all about, how we're going to raise our children, our finances, our future, our time, our treasures, our talents, and living for the kingdom of God. These are things are very different and sometimes create huge, huge problems in, in relationships. But it began here with Judah... Although he's, he's the guy. I mean, he's, there's a lot riding on him. Uh, and yet, he's hanging out with people he shouldn't be. And we'll see at a moment, going to places he shouldn't go. He ends up married to a Canaanite. Which then, the second thing about his family is uh, he ends up having these three sons. Uh, the uh, oldest one, Er, he gives her a Canaanite wife as, as well, named uh, Tamar or Tamar. Uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden you have this potential for what's going to happen through, well, the plan of redemptive history, you know. Uh, are the kings still going to come through this line? Uh, what's going to happen here? Uh, of course, through Judah, the kings come, uh, and uh, King David himself, and eventually the Messiah. There's a lot riding on it. So there's a duty or an obligation that results in Judah's growing family. And that is to produce an heir. The duty or obligation, well, it resulted in God's judgment. As we see here, uh, these first two sons are killed by God, which is a pretty heavy statement. It says of them in verse uh, 6 and 10 that they were wicked. Uh, How wicked were they? (laughs) Wicked enough that God killed them. Uh, Don't read that a lot in Scripture. Uh, That means they were pretty bad. And, you know, when we read stuff like this, you know, the, the, there's the, uh, the person that could read this uh, that knows nothing about the character of God and how cruel, how mean, how judgmental, how it's like, no, probably not. If you were there and you knew everything, you'd probably go, oh, that's why. OK, you know, because God is just uh, in everything that he does. Uh, this word wicked is used in Deuteronomy 17 of those that are involved in idolatry. Again, idolatry to the point of sacrificing your children to the idols. It's used in Genesis 13, 13 of the men of Sodom who were stated to be, to be wicked. Uh, Proverbs 15, 26 says, the thoughts of the wicked, our same word, are an abomination to the Lord. We don't know what they were into, but it involves something of immorality and probably something of idolatry uh, in both. Uh, and that was air. And uh, we would, in terms of Onan's sin, 
uh, again, what he was doing was refusing to, well, he just wasn't very committed to the family. That's why God killed him. His responsibility, the number two son, he wasn't married yet. He knew it, knew it from the time that his brother first got married. <laughs> if he didn't like her very much, he should have run out and got married real quick himself. But uh, he's the single guy. He's the number, number two son. So when God kills his older brother because he's so wicked, uh, you think a little repentant might, <laughs> this might have been an order right there. It's like, if he was into the same thing, it's like, I think it's time to get right with the Lord. <laughs> God's killing people here. But uh, he doesn't. He just continues the way he's going. He does uh, uh, marry her. And of course, then he refuses to have a child with her. The reason he does this is because with his older brother now dead, he's now the older brother. He gets the inheritance. He gets the possessions. He gets the name. He gets everything. But if she has a son, he gets everything. I get nothing. And, uh, and so we have the second son, Onan, uh, refusing to carry out his family obligation. Again, this has nothing to do with sensuality or anything else. It's just whether he's committed uh, to his father, to his brother, or not. Third thing about the duty or the obligation is uh, comes to the third son. We see that in verse 11, that Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. So he's a younger younger guy. He's growing up. And, uh, and he says, lest he die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So uh, he's too young. Uh, she's a pretty young gal herself. She's already twice widowed and she's childless. Uh, and uh, what we find out later in the story is that Judah eventually will, well, Selah is old enough, but he refuses. He kind of recants or reneges uh, on the promise, on the contract to give his third son to Tamar. So she hires an attorney. She sues for breach of contract. She loses in the lower courts, but she takes it to the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco. They overturn the whole thing. She gets $2.2 million and she's okay. Actually, she couldn't really do that in those days, could she? Uh, she's, just, she's kind of pretty desperate here. She's a widow twice. She's pretty young, no kids. She's doing what her father-in-law says. She's living in his tent. She's going to stay there. Uh, it's pretty obvious at some point that he has reneged on the promise. She's not going to be married again. She's not going to have a son. There will be no one to care for her. She's a pretty desperate situation at this, at this point. That's, that's important to, uh, to understand. Judah, in a sense, has uh, manipulated things uh, that prevent her from marrying uh, the other son. So what would she do? Well, we don't see any sense that she knows the Lord. It's not like she's bringing this to the Lord. She's crying out to God. She's a Canaanite. She doesn't really know about the Lord. But apparently she knows the family history. Fam and these guys are all about scheming, aren't they? Going all the way back to uh, Jacob and Isaac and, uh, and so forth. She might know a little bit about the family history. So she comes up with her own idea. So Judah commits to fulfilling a duty to Tamar and then reneges on that. So in verse 12 to 23, we see that Tamar will use a disguise in order to deceive Judah. Verse 12, now in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife died. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah. He and his friend... A good old friend, Hira, the uh, Adulamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going to Tatinda to shear the, his sheep. So she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself. And she sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timna, for she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, because she had covered her face. Then he turned to her, by the way, and said, Please, let me come in to you, for he did not know she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, what will you give me that you may come in to me? And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. So she said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? Then he said, what pledge shall I give you? So she said, your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. Then he gave them to her and went in to her and she conceived by him. So she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, 
to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he did not find her. Then he asked the men at that place, saying, where is the harlot who was openly by the roadside? And they said, there was no harlot in this place. So he turned to Judah and said, I cannot, I cannot find her. Also, the men of the place say, there's no harlot in this place. And then Judah said, let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. For I sent this young goat, and you have not found her. So the th story thickens here. So there's an opportunity, kind of a window of opportunity for Tamar. She gets this idea to disguise herself uh, because uh, she sees a couple of things happen. One is that Judah's wife dies. And uh, you can tell he's really broken up about it, right? He's like probably mourned at least a week. I think that was a re kind of the normal customary thing. Uh, and then he's comforted. He's, he's okay with that. Uh, and he's ready to head off to the big party in town, basically. Uh, and so he uh, basically begins to hang out with his buddy, Hira again, the Canaanite, probably his drinking buddy. Uh, and he's going to go to Timnah during sheep shearing season. Uh, what this means to Tamar is that uh, her father-in-law Jude is now a widower. Uh, knowing the kind of man he is and where he's headed for, she knows that he's probably going to be looking for some female companionship uh, along the way. And, uh, and so she takes off her widow's garments. Uh, she puts a veil on and dresses like a, a prostitute, places herself along the way where he would, uh, would come by. And just to know what's going on here, when I said they're going to town, town for a big time, uh, it's because it's sheep shearing time, just like other times when the harvest of the crop had just come in. So what they did, based on their cultic lifestyle and the worship of, well, it goes all the way back to Babylon and Ishtar, they would worship the fertility goddess. And therefore, if they wanted an abundant crop the next time around, if they wanted their sheep to produce more uh, lambs the next time around, they would go to the temple in that area where that goddess would be represented, well, by her representatives, the temple prostitute, highly esteemed in that culture were these temple prostitutes. And of course, then the interaction, that's as close as you could get to that fertility god, so you would pay, have uh, intimacy, uh, and that was the way you worshiped, and then that would bring about uh, good crops, more sheep the next time. This continues on uh, through the times of Jesus and in Paul's day. In Paul's day, uh, there was a temple in Corinth that had a thousand prostitutes on the streets every night around that temple. It's not a small thing. It's a very big thing, and they're highly esteemed by the way it continues in places like India today. Even though it's against the law, it still continues. And these Hindu men give their daughters 12, 13-year-olds to be the temple prostitutes so that other men can come and worship these fertility gods. It continues on. Very despicable. Uh, so here she is. She sees this opportunity. She knows the character of Judah, what he would be about during this time. She knows the atmosphere in this area because, well, she's a Canaanite herself. So she gets herself there, disguises herself as a harlot, hoping to produce a son for her departed husband. Notice verse 14. So she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, wrapped herself, sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah, for she saw that, again, it's not going to happen. Selah was grown. She should have been married again, but uh, she wasn't. Notice that uh, verse 15, something revealing about Judah and his character. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot. Now, the word, Hebrew her, word here is zena, which means that he thinks she's just, well, in our vernacular, we would say a streetwalker. So there's, no, so there's not like a rational in his mind like, uh, well, I'll just kind of enter into the worship like the other guys here when we hit the old temple. Uh, it's not even that. There's no rationale other than it's just simply, uh, simply lust. Uh, now, when his buddy Hira goes back, he uses the other word. He's looking for a temple prostitute. Even in his mind, he doesn't think Judah would do what Judah did. Uh, and we kind of miss that in the English. But uh, Tamar's disguise uh, also allows her to negotiate a price, and we would say a, a pledge. This is kind of interesting. He says, yeah, I'll bring a goat later. And so she says, uh, we would say, uh, again, the... Uh, the end never justifies the means, but there's a cleverness about what she's doing. She asks for a pledge, 
and he offers to give, well, in our vernacular, he gives her his visa card and driver's license. Uh, that's the idea. The seal wasn't really a ring in those days. Uh, it was a cylinder worn on a cord around the neck, but it was his official seal. It was his absolute identity. We might associate with a passport number or social security number or something like that. And then his cane and so forth with very distinctive carving so that everyone would know that it was his. And, uh, and he gives these things to her. Uh, and then what we have then is the complete of three generations of deceit that had taken place. Interesting, all involving a goat. Jacob deceived Isaac by wearing a goat skin. The goat had to be killed, obviously, and the meal prepared. Judah deceived Jacob by dipping Joseph's blood in, a, in the, uh, his robe, excuse me, into a goat's blood. Now Tamar's deceived Judah uh, involving a disguise, uh, an item of identity, and once again, uh, a goat. Judah, apparently not real proud of his deed, sends his buddy he robbed back to try to get his things back. Uh, they can't find her, uh, and so he loses his, his uh, visa card in the process. So here Judah commits uh, uh, to a, a duty or an obligation to his daughter-in-law that he never fulfills. She then comes up with this idea of using a disguise to, in order to deceive him. Her only motivation is to have a son to carry on her, her husband's lineage and his name and his, his line. Uh, again, this, none of this, this is all real business-like. It's not very, we read it, it's really not meant to be sensual. It's just what she was doing to try to carry on her husband's name. The third thing about, we finally get to a good part. Third thing here is Judah's forced to acknowledge the reason for Tamar's deception, verse 24 to 26. And it came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. When she uh, was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, by the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, please, determine whose these are. You know, because both of us deserve death. So, you know, just... Judah, maybe you can help me out here. Uh, maybe you can figure out who these belong to. The signet and the cord and the staff. So Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I because I did not give her to Selah, my son. And he never knew her again. So Judah, again, not realizing that, that uh, what has transpired, that he's been deceived. He finds out that his, uh, his daughter-in-law Tamar uh, is with child. In, in theory, in theory anyway, she's engaged. She's supposed to marry the third son. And that, in effect, she's engaged to him. Therefore, uh, if she's found pregnant uh, at, during this period, that was the typical punishment. It was typically death. And, of course, if we get this uh, under the law later with Moses, that was uh, the punishment as well. If you were a priest's daughter and it happened to you, you were burned with fire. Uh, but uh, that's the judgment that uh, he's got here. And of course, our sin always looks a lot worse on someone else. Our sin on us, well, you know, I've just always been this way, you know, and, uh, you know, my father had a temper as well, you know, I, you know and, we, we, you know, the, the rationale for who we are and what we are doing in our sin, well, we can figure it out. We're very, we're very gifted. We're all very gifted at uh, rationalization. But man, our sin on someone else, it looks terrible. It looks terrible. Uh, and that's what we have here. It certainly brings to mind uh, the, uh, the situation with Nathan and, and King David. You remember King David who, who basically sees Bathsheba. He ends up calling for her, has a relationship with her, fears that she's now pregnant in order to cover his sin. You remember the story he calls Uriah the Hittite in, uh, from the battle lines. Uriah is one of David's mighty men. Uh, he's a decorated military officer in the nation of Israel, a national hero. He's got one wife, no children. He calls him back from the battlefield, uh, kind of parties up with him, hoping he'll, he'll uh, go see his wife that night. He's so dedicated, he remains basically uh, with the troops. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if his guys are not enjoying the comforts of home, he's not, he's not going to either. It's... Uh, Pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, 
uh, the character of the man. That happens the second night. This isn't happening. So, of course, he's sent back to the battle lines with orders for uh, Joab, who's the CEO out there uh, running the assault on, uh, on one of the towns uh, they're trying to uh, get into. And the order is to take Uriah, let him be on the forward lines, and then withdraw all of the uh, support that he needs. Uh, and he's killed, and probably a lot of the other young men along with him who are part of whatever his assault team near the, uh, near the city wall. David thinks he's now covered his sin, of course. Uh, and then one day, Nathan the prophet comes to him as God's revealed to Nathan what's happened. And Nathan, remember, tells him a story to David who was a shepherd. So he tells him a shepherd's story. He said, David, I don't know what to do. There was uh, this incident that happened where there was a, a little family out here. They had a ewe lamb. They raised it in their home like one of their pets, and they loved it very much. Uh, bordering them was a very wealthy man that had many, many flocks of, uh, of uh, goats and, uh, and sheep, and he had a visitor from out of town. So rather than taking one of his sheep, he goes over and steals the little ewe lamb from this family and he kills it and butchers it, and that's what they have for dinner. What should we do to this man that's done that? David is enraged. We'll kill the man that did that. And, of course, Nathan then said that classic line that we use today, you the man. I, something like that. You are the man. But uh, you are the man, David. And, of course, then David realizes, and, of course, the, the consequences of his own sin become to bear upon him. Uh, and you can read about that in Psalm, Psalm 32. Uh, David, of course, repents. And by the way, under the law, there was no sacrifice. David's supposed to be taken out and killed at that point. And the only reason God forgives him is because of his grace. He absolutely gets what he does not deserve. And David came to know the grace of God. And that's what we're seeing, about to see, what's transpiring here uh, in the life of Judah. The moment of truth comes. And uh, uh, you have to love that line of, of Tamar who waits for this moment and then she's taken out in theory to be burned at this point. And she says, please determine who, th who these are. Uh, take a look at it, this Visa card here, and see if, that, see if that looks familiar, that name on the bottom there. Does that look like a J on that signet? I don't know. Maybe you could help me out here, uh, Judah. And of course, then uh, his classic line, she has been more righteous than I because I did not give her to my son or to uh, give, her, give her to Selah, my son. So basically he's saying, all of this is my fault. All of this is my sin. All of this is my wrongdoing. And nothing should be laid at her feet. It's all me. And makes a public confession of, uh, of his sin. And very much, she's exalted. He's humbled at this point. And we begin to see, well, he's like the rest of the gangs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They all have this turning point. Uh, none of these guys just like start out solid with the Lord and they just go right on through. They all have major speed bumps and major detours in life until they humble themselves uh, and come back to God. Uh, and we see that here in the life of, of Judah. Because he humbled himself, because he repented, he's forgiven and knows the grace of God. We'll give a little evidence for that uh, in a moment. But we try to emphasize God's grace, uh, which we should. Because I think it's so hard for us to, to take in and, and comprehend and understand. And of course, that classic verse in Isaiah, when Isaiah says uh, uh, of God, My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts higher than your thoughts. Uh, and uh, we read that and we, we think, yes, we can't really understand God. But it's talking about a concept of God in, in, uh, in, uh, in context there in Isaiah. It's talking about the grace and the goodness of God. That's what we have a hard time getting our mind around. And I think it's helping us. I hope it's helping us reading and studying about these men and, uh, and women in the, in the Old Testament. Paul says this in, uh, in Titus 2.11. He says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And we're so thankful that we've come to know uh, the grace of God if we've become a believer and a follower of Jesus. But Paul goes on and says, that grace then begins to teach us something. In verse 12, it's teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age 
looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We receive God's grace into our lives. He forgives us no matter what it is that we've done. And then that grace comes into our lives. And if we've really repented, if we've really accepted the Lord, then that grace begins to teach us. And it teaches us that uh, uh, we need to stay away from worldly lust. We need to stay away from ungodliness. It drives us to live our lives righteously and godly uh, in the present age. Why? Because we're looking forward and looking to our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So grace is not a license to just do whatever you want whenever you want. Grace comes in and forgives and changes, gives us something we don't deserve, and then it begins to teach us and change us. Well, how did it uh, work out in Judah's uh, uh, life and his own admission here? Well, uh, he certainly kind of fades, fades from the pages of Scripture for a period of time. And we go on and we study about Joseph, which we'll, we'll do next week. But later in chapter 44, as you know, there's a drought in Egypt. Joseph's been raised to prime minister of the most powerful planet on the earth at the time. Uh, and in this position, people are coming to him. And eventually his brothers come. Uh, Joseph has long since forgiven his brothers for selling him into slavery uh, and uh, sees the hand of God and everything. But he wants to be reconciled to his brothers, but he can't know if he can be reconciled after the horrible thing they've done unless they have repented themselves. You can forgive someone and never be reconciled to them if they never repent, if they never change, if they don't want to be forgiven. You can forgive, but he wants reconciliation. You remember the whole story he does where he, he uh, gives them the grain but hides their silver in their bags and they're like, oh no, you know, and the father, Jacob, well, you better get back down there and buy more grain. Oh, we can't go unless we bring our son Benjamin and so forth. So they finally bring Benjamin and, uh, and Joseph's kind of like, I've got him now. He wants to see his little brother, <laughs> but he also can find out what's in their heart and he keeps Benjamin as I'm going to keep him until you bring your father and everybody else down here. And Judah jumps in. And Judah begins to beg for the life of Benjamin, his little half-brother. Take my life. Do anything you want with me. I'll give my life for his. That's a different guy. That's a different guy that goes to Timna, right? This is a different guy. Uh, it wasn't all done here, but God began to work in his life uh, and, to, uh, and to change him. Then chapter 49 We've, we, we've alluded to and mentioned a couple of times, Jacob at the end of his life, he's going to pronounce these predictions, these prophecies over his sons. Uh, and this is what he says in regards to, uh, to Judah. Now, verse 2, uh, just to give you a couple of the verses, <clears throat> he says, Gather together and hear you sons of Jacob and listen to Israel, your father. And then it's number one son, Reuben, you're my firstborn. Verse 4 says, <laughs> You're as unstable as water. You're not going to excel. You're, you're done. You've disqualified yourself. Apparently, there's, there's never been a, a, a humbling and a repentance or anything. So he goes to sons 2 and 3, verse 5. Uh, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. So, I mean, these are the guys that are the mass murderers. So they've kind of remained uh, uh, and never really uh, changed or turned or at all. But notice what he says of Judah, who Jacob has now observed all these years. Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. The scepter, the kings, the king holds the scepter. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. The kings are going to come from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh, that's the Messiah, until the Messiah comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Judah, to you, God's got a lot of good things for you and your descendants in the future. And from you, the kings of Israel will come. And from you, the Messiah will come. I'd say that's pretty good evidence that Judah really repented and began to walk with God at, uh, at this point. He starts out not fulfilling a duty and a commitment he should have to Tamar. She's forced to disguise herself and deceive him uh, but now that deception brings his own sin to life. Now she will deliver twin sons. These last couple of verses, 27 to 30. Now it came to pass at that time for giving birth that behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was when she was giving birth 
that the one put out his hand and the midwife took a scarlet thread and, uh, and bound it on his hand saying, this one came out first. Then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly and she said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore, his name was called Perez, which means uh, break, breaking through. Afterwards, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand and his name was called Zerah. So the twins are, are delivered and uh, uh, we've got twin, twin boys and of course their names are based on their birth in the story here. And it's interesting, the Jacob narrative begins, the story begins with the wrestling of two twins in the mother's womb. And basically Jacob's story ends here with two twins uh, once, once again. Now, the significant thing about this, and the, I think the reason their names are mentioned is so that we won't miss this, is they're mentioned again in the New Testament. First, they're mentioned in the book of Ruth. At the end of Ruth, of course, Ruth is in the Moabitess. It comes back with her mother-in-law, ends up a uh, wonder, wonderful love story there and uh, of uh, Mary's Boaz. And, uh, and of course, they begin at the end to have their children and the genealogy then is listed that takes you from Perez, the guy we just uh, saw being born, uh, from Perez to King David. So we know the genealogy connects now Tamar, the Canaanite, to King David. So then when you get to Matthew's gospel, and Matthew writes his genealogy because it was important, if you're Jewish and you're going to say that this guy is a Messiah, you better be able to connect him to David because we're looking for the Messiah to be a Davidic king. He's got to come in the lineage of Judah based on what we just read in Genesis 49. He's got to come through David based on the promises to David. Uh, and so Matthew begins to write the genealogy uh, of Jesus Christ uh, there's some very strange things because he throws women's names into this. You don't do that in, in a Jewish genealogy. It's this guy begot, this guy begot, and so forth. So a very unusual genealogy in Matthew 1. It says, The book of genealogy, of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez. And Zerah by Tamar, and then it goes to Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Neshon, Neshon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. Some things, uh, again, that are noticeable here that are important. And that is there's five women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Tamar, the Canaanite. Rahab, the Canaanite prostitute. Ruth, the Moabite. And Bathsheba, only mentioned as in verse 6, as the wife of Uriah. Uh, again, and she's a, a Hittite. So you're going to list the genealogy of the Messiah. You really want to impress these Jewish folks to make sure they understand he's connected directly to King David and he's connected directly to Judah uh, as the prophecy that Jacob uh, gave us and therefore the son of Abraham also. So you're going to throw in the names of these uh, Canaanite gals and a Moabite and a, and a Hittite. What's, what's the purpose for that? Because at the beginning of the gospel, Matthew wants to make it very clear that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, not just the Jewish people. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but the Savior of the whole world. Also in Luke's gospel, then he records when, when it's time for consecration of Joseph and Mary, remember, take baby Jesus uh, into the temple there in Luke 2.29, and they have this whole scene with Simeon who's been waiting, a prophet of God, waiting. God says, you won't die until you see the Messiah he holds Jesus in his arms and he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. So I would come, bring hope, love, forgiveness, and by his grace, we would be saved. Just like Judah, just like Isaac. Just like Jacob, just like uh, Abraham. One uh, commentary I read this week, uh, Andrew Reed, who's uh, Australian, wrote this in his commentary. 
In this way, it's possible to see all of life as a medium of God's activities. He's not just active when we read our Bible and pray. He's also active when we live in our world. Hence, when we wake up tomorrow, we don't wake up to a day without God. Tomorrow's God's day. For he made it, formed it, works in it. What's more, he wants you to enter tomorrow determined to be his person in it. And to let Christ be formed in you as you allow his word to interact with your situation. It's up to us. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, uh, the story of these guys, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for it. And um, because it shows us that, that nobody's beyond reach. Nobody's beyond reach. And these, and these are guys that did things that should have known better. Judah's no Canaanite. I mean, he knew better. Did it anyway. I mean, if it, it's like, you, you look at his sons, man. If God struck them dead, they must have really been bad. They must have been very bad and beyond hope. Uh, but you know, in reality, the Bible says all of sin to come short of the glory of God. We're lucky he hasn't struck us all dead. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And all he asks is we would believe in him. The writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And uh, I pray that we would be earnestly seeking him today, tomorrow, each day. Because God wants us to be, well, like <laughs> Mark said early on, there's a lot out there to bum us out. But actually, from God's perspective, we can be optimistic every day. Because God is working in our lives. He has a plan for our lives He's got a plan for you this afternoon and tomorrow uh, and the next day. Again, it begins as we humble ourselves before him, we receive his grace and his forgiveness, but then he begins to work out his story uh, in our lives because he does want to touch other people through us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord. The earth can shake. The sky comes down.